So welcome all to today's uh, uh, energy digitization webinar series. So this is part of this new efforts at Texas A&M uh, Energy Institute, trying to bring uh, together a, you know, energy and data science um, in this new initiative called energy digitization. And uh, I can think of uh, no better speaker than today's uh, seminar speaker, Dr. Xing Wang. Um, Xing is the CTO of uh, Centrica uh, Business Solutions. Uh, he is a leader in industry in uh, a number of uh, different posts. He had over 25 years of experience in technology innovation and engineering management in the energy industry. Uh, he joined Centrica in 2016, but before that he was the research and development director and head of application engineering at GE Alstom Grid Solutions, where he led the development of software solutions for power grids, oil and gas, and energy market operations. And uh, Xing is joining us today from uh, Seattle. Um, what will we, uh, a, a few uh, housekeeping rules before we get started. We'll have Xing present for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll have uh, one of our own uh, experts in electricity markets, Professor Steve Puller, to provide a short commentary. And after that, we'll open up for general audience Q&A. Uh, the whole session will run for about one hour. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Wang, uh, uh, you can, uh, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor She, and, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, it, it's my pleasure to be uh, to be here, uh, even not physically. I'd love to have an opportunity in the future to uh, to, to visit uh, uh, Texas A and A and M and and have more discussion with 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 colleagues over there. But today, I think it's a virtual session, so I want to uh, um, talk a little bit about um, Centrica Business Solutions experience in um, the, the distributed energy resource and how do we, you know, utilize and 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 you know you, those resources and you know and getting the flexibility out of those out of those resources and use them to provide grid services that can allow us to integrate more renewable energy into the grid. So with that, I want just a, a quick summary of uh, the, the the agenda. Uh, so I think Centrica might be a still a new name for some of the our colleagues. So I just want to uh, just have a quick introduction about Centrica and what we do uh, as a company. And then, uh, or probably you know, DER is a hot topic, but I want to come from a different perspective, from a customer's perspective, to see why there's a growth of DERs, right? What why why customer is interested in investing in the DER uh, in the DERs. Uh, and then talk about from uh, the uh, grid and market perspective and see what's the challenges and opportunities for us. Um, so the, the, the key of utilizing the flexibility from DERs is through aggregation. And I will talk a bit, bit about the, uh, the virtual power plant technology and, and use some real examples to see how VPP is helping to aggregate the DER flexibility and provide grid services. And the other key concept I want to bring, uh, introduce probably very briefly due to the time limit today uh, is the local energy market concept and how that would, would, would address the um, uh, concerns in terms of uh, transmission and distribution system coordination because of the, uh, the uh, you know, penetration of the DERs and, and, you know, and the services we will get out of that. And, that, and we'll end with some takeaways and, and, and go into the Q&A sessions uh, with uh, Pro Professor Puller. So a very quick overview of uh, Centrica. Um, uh, it's a, a Centrica is an energy, international energy supply and solutions uh, company. Um, it, it, it headquarter is in Windsor in UK. Uh, it's actually a fairly large company as with a very long history. Uh, you probably recognize our brand in UK, British Gas, right? It's over 100 years old uh, um, company over there. Uh, in, back in 2013, uh, you know, Centrica acquired Direct Energy, which is uh, basically your neighbor, right, in Texas, at, at headquartered over there, and the business unit headquartered in Metro Park in New Jersey. So Direct Energy is our main energy brand in North America, covering both US and, and Canada. 
Uh, we also have a global brand, Centrica Business Solutions, because the com as, as an energy utility company, um, the Centrica really also feels the pressure, right, in terms of, um, you, you know, the, the lower energy price in the recent years and also the, the need to decarbonize the energy supply. So energy, uh, so Centrica Business Solutions really a, is, a, um, is a new business unit, technology focused unit to address the you know, customer's needs in, in you know, energy efficiency, in uh, clean and uh, clean distributed energy, you know, the energy resilience and all of this, uh, you know, uh, needs from CNI customer side. So this really is a technology arm for, for the cent for Centrica. And the unit was created uh, back in 2016. And I joined Centrica Business Solutions um, in July 2016. So I was lucky to be uh, chosen to run their technology function. So in terms of um, um, distributed energy assets, uh, set, you know, CBS is still a fairly new company, but through, through acquisitions and, and organic growth, we're already pretty, uh, has, have a pretty decent size. So we're really monitoring over five gigawatts, you know, of the DER assets uh, globally and 1.9 gigawatt of that is, is under our virtual, virtual power plant platform management. Basically we're getting, that's the capacity that we get from all the CNI customers and offer to different uh, market operators. And in, specifically in North America, uh, we, are, we are playing in six you know, ISO RTUs footprint, right? And our, our uh, DR book in North America is about 800 megawatts uh, to date. And a, a large part of that is in the PGM uh, territory. Uh, we also have a small footprint in ERCOT um, uh, but you know, it, it's definitely a lot of potential to grow. Um, um, one, one thing I worth mentioning uh, is we are we are in the process of uh, uh, divest direct energy uh, segment to NRG, which is another generation company, and that deal might close uh, either end of this year or beginning of next year. Uh, but we will keep our presence in North America as part of the Centrica Business Solutions. It's continue providing the flexibility services and energy efficient services to our customers in North America. Um, so I want to just as kind of quick summarize of why we have, why customers are interested in DERs, right? So certainly the, the, the number one reason I think is resilience of power supply. You know, there's those, uh, uh, you know, for the, you know, there, there are plenty of, there, there have been plenty of uh, um, natural disasters uh, or, uh, in recent years and, and which caused the uh, uh, um, issues on, on the uh, resilience from the customer side, right? For both C and I and residential customers. So resilience definitely is the number one reason that they want to invest. They also, some of the customers, um, um, they are in the high, electricity uh, rate air region and the, and they definitely want to lower their utility bill as as a, as a, you know, lower their operating cost and the large part of the electricity bill is 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 the generation capacity payment and transmission distribution capacity payment right so they if they lower their energy consumption from grid at least from today's bill they will significantly lower their and uh, you know energy energy um, uh, cost so that's uh, and the, the some of the customer really is concerned about the de decarbonization and they want to contribute more uh, to the net zero target. Customer like Amazon, you know, like large corporate like Amazon, like Microsoft, they all have their own target, right? And we're helping them to address those concerns. Uh, the other angle is falling technology cost, right? I mean, today if you look at compared to today's uh, solar panel cost versus uh, even two, three years ago, it is a significant um, drop. And, and the energy, uh, um, energy storage, uh, is, 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 is drop, the price is dropping very significantly. If you attend the, if you watch the video of uh, you know, Tesla's battery day, you, know, you, you see that uh, Elon Musk is promising another 56% of um, cell, you know, battery cell price drop uh, in the next uh, three three years, I believe, either three years or five years, just quite close, right? So I think that that price range is getting to the area that is economic, well, economically 
you know, the DERs like energy storage, it, it, it starts to make sense for customer to own and operate, right? And, and there are uh, grid and utility incentives. There's also, you know, like, you know, wholesale market access. Now we've got FERC order 2222 that really paved the path for the DERs to provide more services to the grid. And the challenge is really from customer perspective is the total cost of ownership. Still, the cost is number one, their concerns, right? I mean, it has to make sense for them in the long run. The utility interconnect process is not necessarily the easiest for the customer to connect their DERs to the grid and, and also the long-term revenue guarantee, right? That, that, is, that is basically set by many, many different factors. And from grid and market perspective, operator's perspective, the they currently see this a lot of, uh, if you talk with some, you know, RTOs and engineer, you know, in the control room or utility, they see this as kind of a, 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 a um, distraction, right? This is like, how do we manage all these zillions of stuff, you know, in our, in our network, you know, and without uh, direct measurement, right? So the visibility and the forecast of DERs, right? The, 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 the control of DERs. And, and also the planning and grid config, configuration to handle the, 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 the rapid uh, growth of DERs. The, those are the you know, grid operators and market operators common concerns, right? And, and also with DERs increase, if you don't control them, that means you have less actually demand, res demand response you can get, you know, because the, the demand, uh, the, the consumption actually is decreasing, right? Because we have more distributed solar panels in the day, in the hot days. So, so those are all issues. And we also mentioned uh, about, about the uh, TND coordination as well. Um, so, but but if you handle that well, you know, DER can contribute quite well to the grid reliability and market efficiency, right? And it, you know, we 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 all know about non-wire, so-called non-wire alternatives instead of spending tons of money in New York City, for example, to reinforce their network. You could build a battery at the end of the, the, the feeder, right, to, to help you to, uh, to operate to, to in, the, in, the, in, the, in the peak, right, to lower your uh, peak uh, uh, load consumption, to, that, that will reduce the need to in, reinforce the, the grid, uh, the distribution grid. And that's just one example, right? So we'll have some, a few more examples later to talk about how do we achieve that. Um, this is also a very busy and to a certain, certain degree ugly um, diagram, but I think it's quite useful um, because the, I think the main message here is um, we, you know, there are different type of assets, right? There's merchant assets, meaning front meter, big assets could still deeply embedded in distribution grid, but they're relatively big, right? There are CNI behind meter assets. Right, uh, which is uh, uh, you know you basically have a battery or or CHP that that is you know running behind the meter. There's also residential assets. So we have different technology to manage different uh, assets today, and we can aggregate all of them together as a virtual power plant, right? And to and to provide services to both grid and and markets through different uh, programs or or market products. Those products can be also traded or managed by a local energy market, right? Or in utilities terminology, probably they call it DERMS, Distributed Energy Resource Management System. So this really looks like a generation scheduling system in the old term versus, you know, a traditional SCADA or EMS, right? So that's, that's the, the platform they're managing. Uh, so the idea is, you know, to really enable the uh, DERs participation in the market, you need the different programs, you need different product, right, to the, the incent, incentive, in, incentives to really encourage them to, to participate. Otherwise, it's not their main purpose to build DERs to participate in those markets or, 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 or grid services. And, and uh, I'm sure you, some of you have probably um, read the Lazard um, energy storage uh, uh, annual report. I think this is just a uh, the latest version and the illustrate in different markets um, where the value come from for a distributed uh, energy storage, right? Uh, so you can see that uh, in um, in some regions, you know, the wholesale the wholesale uh, uh, value is bigger, but but mostly, you know, it, it's still in demand charge management. Some some of the customer 
uh, values on the fuel reduction side, right? So now let's talk about how do we leverage those flexibilities from uh, from uh, those DERs, right? So imagine you be if you have a four megawatt uh, battery or flexibility flexible uh, resource that can be available at 90 percent, and you want to offer this resource into a wholesale market, right? Like P, let's say PGM's Reg D market to provide regulation, and then you know. Even though it's 90% available, but you you can guarantee. I mean, 90% is not enough, right? I mean, you have to be cl I mean, close to like six nine or you know really you know when you when you're needed, you have to provide. Otherwise, you get a penalty, right? So instead of just rely on one me four megawatt resource, if you imagine if you could aggregate other smaller resources, put those into the same pool, right? With the four megawatt battery, then you get a very much very higher much higher availability and reliability of a virtual power plant and you can offer other services also in addition to the frequency regulation that you you're offering to the PGM so really is the, the also the increased ability for customer to tackle multiple revenue streams by aggregating uh, you know large and small resources into the same pool uh, through a virtual power plant technology Yeah, and that this is basically uh, to uh, illustrate, you know, within a si single um, virtual power plant, you got different DER components that will react. Uh, for example, for the battery, this is what we're talking about in Europe is this frequency response, right? And then you can you can use different DER components to respond different part of frequency band and to optimize the overall droop curve performance and maximize the benefit and also prolong. Right, the duration of a battery that can can participate in those market because bar batteries uh, energy uh, um, duration is, is quite limited by right? most of them, especially lithium ion batteries. Yeah, so so that's just further illustrate the whole process and what you know what a synthetic what we call a synthetic pool can can provide uh, in terms of a highly uh, valuable and highly available uh, service. And, and the real example, uh, sorry, I have to, you know, we can, you know, have a more, maybe question and answer at the end, but I can't, uh, I, I, I don't want to kind of just drill down too deep, too much, in, provide too much detail in one of the slides, because each of the slides actually have a lot of, a lot of <laughs> the things that we can talk about. I apologize, so we have to scan through quite quickly. Um, so just to bring it to life a little bit, right, in terms of virtual power plant technology. So, Turhill is a uh, place in Belgium, right? So, and Tesla uh, a few years ago built a 32 megawatt, uh, sorry, I think it's a not sorry, 18 megawatt battery, I believe, uh, where I think it should set somewhere. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, 18.2 megawatt power pack storage. And they're trying to participate in Ilia's market. Really, Ilia is the Belgium um, a market operator or grid operator. And they couldn't figure out how to make money. Uh, because they can only tackle one revenue stream, and and it's like I said, the the the, the duration of the battery and also the uh, the size of the battery is not meeting some of the requirements. So the company we acquired in actually in Antwerp, Belgium, the name is Restore. This is where we acquired our re, uh, our virtual power plant technology, and now it's fully part of our Centrica Business Solutions. So the 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 Restore technology really it is leveraging some of the other CNI loads, right? Including different type of loads and bundle that in with this, this large battery and create a 32 megawatt virtual power plant. And, and with that pooling effect, so they're able to really provide the very reliable service to, to, to Ilia and also be able to make money out of it. So this is really a, a live example on how a virtual power plant would help to Aggregate different different type of DERs right together and form a form a synthetic pool and provide services to to the grid. And this is some example on what you know overall what our reliability um, uh, to the different um, uh, R, uh, RTOs or ISOs uh, over the years. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the. The other example is the same technology actually, actually we, we, we were using to help a um, um, Japanese 
utility company TEPCO to establish their uh, DER programs. Um, and, and this is an ongoing program and we're getting more and more customers sign up and be able to leverage their flexible, flexible resources to provide the much needed service in Japanese uh, net, uh, grid. Yeah, talk, talking a little bit about the uh, technical side, right? So this is a very high level uh, virtual power plant solution architect. So you can see that uh, we have our power radar in the AWS cloud. So it, it is a cloud-based solution. So all the uh, most part of the smartness, the calculation, the machine learning, the building the model and optimization is happening in the cloud. Uh, but also there's edge devices uh, such as uh, um, we have a, a couple of edge devices, FlexPond and, and also the, uh, the, the, the communication bridge, which have some, some local capabilities in terms of storage and computation, uh, comput computation and that, that can manage the local um, uh, assets, right? And there's also a uh, uh, market uh, channel or market route to market or market interface to the ISO and RTO, RTOs. Uh, and it also offers uh, our uh, customers a, this, uh, a screen basically or, or the, uh, uh, application, right? For them to monitor their DERs and also the, uh, their performance in terms of market or utility program participants, participation. So that's kind of is all I want to talk about in, very quickly about virtual power plant capability, right? And we can have a bit more discussion later um, um, with with Steve and and Le, you know about you know and with everyone to you know for some question and answers. So I want to switch the gear a little bit, checking the time. Yeah, uh, um, uh, to the lo local energy market concept, right? Um, so local local flexibility. Uh, is becoming uh, a, a, a big topic uh, in European countries, especially in uh, also in UK. So it's real now, right? It's not like, a, I mean, it's, it's growing rapidly. So how do we leverage that local flexibility to achieve, to help renewable integration is becoming a big topic. So you can see that, uh, in, you know, that UKPN, WPD, and MPG, those are the local uh, distribution companies in UK, and they all have needs right to uh, leverage some of their local capability local flexibilities and national grid in uk which is their grid and market operator also want to tap into the local flexibility to help them to manage frequency and some of the reserves and then if you look at yeah i think this yeah if you look at the this is probably the hold on Apologize, I think the sequence is a little bit uh, off. I think this one, yeah, I think it, it's okay. We can still talk about this. The, in terms of DRs, um, this is kind of a, a um, high, very high level view in, ter uh, in terms of digital platforms that, that is managing the whole uh, power systems, right? We, we, we all very familiar with the market management system, MMS, EMS, GMS, you know, network apps for the transmission side. On the dis distribution side, we have a, um, a, a DMS, you know, kind of mirror the EMS function for distribution network, right? We also have uh, a DERMS or, or local energy market as a market system, right? For the local, for the distribution um, assets, right? That's an asset management uh, and, and scheduling system. And, and also we have VPP and demand response management system to really looking at you know, how do we aggregate those very small assets, including the, the residential assets, right? And through not a traditional SCADA um, channel to manage that, but through the IoT, right? The IoT monitoring, control monitoring technology to manage those very small assets and aggregate them and then bid them, bid them into the local energy market or uh, send the information to the derms. Yeah. So that, Sorry, the, the, but it's about the sequence, but let's go back to the local energy market. We talked about the need of tapping into the local flexibility. And there's a really good example that in Cornwall in, in UK, which is the south uh, west, uh, the corner of the of the uh, uh, England, right? There, there are a lot of uh, renewables there. 
and there's which cause some of the network um, challenges, right? And during that in the summer, in the winter, and they, they require a, a, a lot of uh, heating uh, demand, which is causing the reverse uh, network transgression challenge, right? So, so really, I mean, how do we leverage? How do we build and leverage local flexibility to to uh, allow more renewable being aggregated, right, or, or being integrated into the grid, and also to help defer some of the very extensive um, uh, grid in reinforcement projects is, is, is becoming a, a key topic. And the other driver is the uh, carbon decarbonization. Well, we want to definitely lower carbon overall, but especially in that region, they're very passionate about that. Uh, so as a result, uh, Centrica um, working with some of the partners uh, to we, so basically we create this program called Cornwall Local Energy Market Program back in 2000, end of 2016. And we, we got the support from uh, European Regional Development Fund uh, uh, for about 19 million uh, to, to experiment right, a local energy market in that Cornwall region. Um, so the the project scope really is you know uh, three major four major areas. One is from uh, from from CNI side test some of the new tech new new technology right the energy storage CHP you know distributed wind distributed solar uh, and to achieve the CO two savings um, from from yeah from a large customer perspective from consumer perspective choose one Henry home you know test solar plus storage test you know micro aggregation uh, technology and and so on and then we also build in in part of the program we we commit to build a pro platform a local energy market platform end to end so to to allow a a you know a local flexibility to be procured from that platform and there's also some research research um, activities so the if you look at the the partners so, so certainly we have the the, uh, the the tso the transmission operator national grid as one of the partner the local um, utility wpd western power distribution as one of the partner we also have off -gen, which is their equivalent of FERC, right the regular regulatory body also actually as a partner in, in the program to monitor and learn from this whole process and so what's the right model for the future distribution system operator model dso model right so so in this case local energy market is a um i would say a example or, or one approach to real to realize future uh, dso model and, and this is a very high level architecture of the whole uh, project right so you can see in the middle there's a local energy market so at the very beginning of the program, we, we define what we want to achieve in short term, what we want to achieve in long term and mid term, right? And, and uh, you can see there are multiple buyers uh, from, you know, for the, for the, for the local flexibility. There's a, a, a national grid will buy it, right? So, and will allow those uh, flex, local flexibility to participate in wholesale markets. Multiple, multiple, multiple wholesale market mechanisms, and also WPD also would want to buy from this same market. So that implies there's TND coordination that needed for the for, for that market for the same services. Uh, so this is also a high-level software architecture. Uh, in case you're you're familiar with uh, the the software uh, technology, so we're leveraging the uh, AWS cloud. We're working with AWS very closely and leveraging the the latest and greatest uh, technology so that we actually can build this end-to-end -end platform in a little bit over a year time and it's fully functional right now. Even though it's a expert, it's a pilot or innovation project, but the platform is fully functional and and we have interest from a market operator uh, in europe that want to acquire that platform and operate on, on, on that for uh, for the future lo uh, local energy markets uh, in europe um, so in terms of how market works so there are multiple uh, auctions over the time so in the long long-term auctions are really for capacities right so there are months ahead or, or week ahead and, and then you go into the day ahead and intraday and real time those are then becoming more a reserve and utilization discussion right so you can see also you know dso is really interesting some of the 
um, uh, services for their congestion management and post uh, post fault uh, re response. And the ESO is really interested in taking those uh, uh, flexibility for their balancing mechanisms and congestion management as well. And, and there's some, um, you know, kind of numbers or facts about, you know, how we try it out. So it's just worth mentioning, we have uh, about 300 megawatt hour reserve contracts, you know, uh, signed, you know, through the platform. We've run uh, 50 auction uh, rounds so far. Um, and, and yeah, and it's proven that 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 is working, right, for both of the uh, uh, TSO and, and DSO, D, DNO perspective is working. And if you search website, I think we're posting, start to post some uh, the project report and the final report uh, and to share with the industry. And you can find the perspective from uh, National Grid, from WPD and Centrica, you know, in terms of this project. Uh, if you couldn't find it, let me know. I, I can share some of the reports uh, with, with you. Uh, so this is a basically a, a um, uh, screenshot right of the platform and you can see that the, the geographic regions and, and some of the, the, the conflict that between the uh, potential conflict between the needs uh, from the, uh, the, the, the transmission operators and the distribution operators and then soft and the platform will you know basically run the optimization uh, program to solve the, to try to provide op, um, options to uh, manage those constraints, those conflicts, and, and provide the most uh, optimal solution. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of very quick overview about the local energy market platform. So there, there are definitely, um, I think most important value of that experiment is lessons learned from uh, for different um, uh, participants in that uh, in that program, right? Uh, I think what we learned from that project is that local local flexibility are needed to decarbonize the grid and support the, the electrification of heating and transportation. And if you if you're you following UK news, you, you you probably noticed that the number ten, uh, Boris Johnson, you know, uh, have just uh, released a ten point their ten points uh, plan for the uh, decarbonization, trying to use a green initiative to bounce back their economy uh, from the COVID-19 impact. And, and they talked a lot about the, um, you know, the technologies we, we mentioned, right? So I think, I think you to, but in order to decarbonize that you need more renewable, right? And in order to get more renewable integrating the grid, you need more flexibility, much more than what we have today. And local flexibility is definitely one important source of that. So the LEM uh, uh, platform demonstrate the feasibility to have a distributed network operator and the system transmission system operator, you know, to procure the concurrent flexibility service through a single spot market. Um, so, you know, we, we have market rules documents. So certainly it's still early stage. There's many details we have to figure out, but conceptually it prove, prove it's working. Uh, so there are high interest from uh, consumers to participate in LEM, but they want to be hands-free. They certainly don't want to manage their assets, right? They don't want to be the market participants. They want to participate in a, in a very automated way or through aggregators. So they, so you do really low maintenance, low cost participation. So that's one of the key thing for the local market or local for the future uh, DERMS uh, program is you, you, need, you, you really need to provide the low cost entry for those normal customers to be able to participate in the future uh, local markets. And also the other set lessons learned, we, we were assuming at the beginning, right? So we have we would, would have a full network model, just like what we're doing for the, uh, uh, we did for the wholesale markets, right? And uh, in the for the transmission model, but that's not available. So we we still need to do more working as an industry to improve the distribution, distribution network, um, of, you know, visibility and data availability. And if we don't act, integrate with those network apps or, up, or or even the outage management systems, you know the LEM uh, platform for TND coordination is not going to function too well because we don't have the real time visibility of the grid. Um, yeah, and and also we we've we've 
tested the cutting edge cloud based uh, technology for this type of purpose and, and really allow us to uh, implement the software implement platform really very quickly, very, in a very, very, very agile my, manner. I came from a, a more traditional vendor before I, I implemented a lot of uh, market systems uh, in, in the US that was my background and, and I can tell you compare with what we did before and you know leveraging the latest technology stack will, in, will, will really enable our development, our industry to move much faster than, than we, what we did before. And it's in a very secure way. Um, yeah, and, and also we, we actually, at the beginning, we also uh, created a sub project to test out the blockchain because at that time blockchain was really a, a hot topic. But you, you remember back in 2016, 2017, we didn't want to, uh, to miss the boat. So we had a small project test that, but the result is, we really couldn't identify some any real real valuable use cases to apply blockchain in the energy or industry in the energy industry or, or specifically in that local energy market segment. Um, so we basically stopped uh, quickly uh, after a few months. We decided to uh, stop that because we couldn't identify any valuable use cases. So that's all my um, presentations and. A few uh, takeaways. Uh, maybe we just don't have to go through, you know, reading that. I, I just maybe leave it here uh, for people to 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 read through. But at the same time, I, I will hand hand it back to to Professor She and Professor Fuller to to start some uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Xing. I mean, this is a exciting exciting presentation and uh, paves the way for a lot of. Uh, future uh, based on your early success and projects. So, you know, uh, I would like to now turn the podium to my good friend and colleague, Professor Steve Fuller, who have done a lot of work and uh, research in the area of uh, electricity market and energy economics in general. Um, after Steve's commentary, we'll then open up for Q&A uh, from the general audience. So Steve, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Le. Uh, and I, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to chat here and uh, uh, get with such a, a steam group of uh, engineers. As Le mentioned, um, I'm an economist, um, and I look at you know study energy markets and like and electricity markets uh, in particular. And so I think I'm going to give a couple of comments, uh, a couple of messages from kind of the economics perspective. And I think most of these comments are simply going to go to reinforce the importance of the types of technologies that Jing is developing and how those technologies can leverage the flexibilities that DER gives us to improve the overall market efficiency. Um, I think there are three messages that I want to kind of bring, apart, bring out and um, those are essentially going to come from the perspective of someone wearing essentially a policy, a policy hat. So the first um, economist message, if you want to call it that, relates to how DER um, is intertwined with optimal policy targeting carbon. You know, Jing talked about how customer incentives to employ DER um, is often driven by you know, value to customer. And one of those values to the customer, whether it be in the US or the UK, um, is meeting certain self-imposed targets uh, to become uh, you know, carbon neutral or to get to net zero carbon. You know, I think from a policy perspective, thinking about carbon and electricity sector, the challenges basically exist when private incentives don't align with social incentives. You know, from the so uh, the social incentives, um, you know, say if we're talking about reducing carbon emissions, you know, in general, there's this concept of the social cost of carbon. There's debate about like what that number exactly is, but let's just you know take a number of forty dollars per ton. So you know, the standard you know, kind of econ 101 perspective would be uh, to support a carbon tax um, and that doing that provides the right market-based price signals on the supply side, so on the supply side. So, you know, how firms change their input mix in the electricity sector, it could be, you know, coal versus natural gas versus, uh, versus renewables. Um, so that's the firm side. And then on the energy side, of course, how energy users change their consumption levels to reflect whatever the, you know, the social, total social costs of electricity consumption are at any point in time. Um, you know, so if you think about the concept of, you know, a carbon tax, if this were the transport sector, just to shift us out for a moment, um, you know, a carbon tax would, you know, say, say we're thinking about uh, transportation of, of, you know, consumer durable goods. 
Um, you know, it would have implications for the mode and frequency of transport. So say if we're talking about like, you know, big rig trucks, which goods are transported and with the frequency of it and on the demand side, you know, how much we're buying in stores of these goods. There's an exact analog in the electricity sector. Um, so if we focus on that and one were to price uh, at the social cost of carbon, what we'd likely see, not surprisingly, is a shift away from coal generation. This is, we've been seeing this already for quite a while now towards natural gas and to some extent increased renewable generation. So those are the social incentives if, you're, if that's kind of the policy hat that you're wearing. Uh, from the private incentives, and this is what Jing was getting at, is you know, there, there are a variety of private incentives to, to utilize DER. One is just the resiliency, and, um, and that matters whether you're a residential customer or commercial or industrial customer. And, and it appears um, that there's you know, significant demand for that. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there are private incentives, self-imposed incentives to try and become to reduce carbon emissions. And whether that's because you think your customers value that or you think your stockholders value it or for, for whatever reason, they're private incentives to do that. So again, stepping back to the general policy problem with, with carbon, it's that the private incentives are often not aligned with those social incentives unless there's something like a carbon tax or your explicit carbon tax or something very similar. So where, what does that mean for DER? You know, a nice feature of DER is if there is low cost technology out there that efficiently aggregates, then it brings us closer to what economists might think of as the first best, closer to carbon pricing, where there's not an explicit tax, it's that there are these other private incentives which can be enabled through the different uh, DER technologies um, and would presumably increase the take up of renewables. Um, so that's message number one is how DER relates to, um, to climate policy. Um, the second message from economists, and let me just kind of take this as an opportunity to, to make a point that I think we, we often make, so allow me to get on my soapbox a little bit, um, is that tariffs on both, so, so for, say, say we're talking about residential, uh, behind the meter technologies that could be aggregated here. Um, tariffs should be the same on both sides of the meter. So if you're paying more for power generated on one side of the meter than the other side of the meter, then that's just gonna create a market distortion. You know, may, may, that may well increase the incentives for renewables, but that's not necessarily the right incentive. So um, kind of the soapbox message that, you know, we often make is, um, you know, get the price of quote generation the same on both sides of the meter. And then the final message from the economic perspective, and this, and this is something that's, you know, well known to engineers, but I think that it still is worth kind of amplifying this to people in the field, um, has to do with, um, you know, pricing um, congestion on the grid. You know, so as we all know, you know, the reason we price congestion in the high voltage grid um, is or the, we do price congestion and that's how we get, you know, nodal pricing that we get in many of the organized wholesale electricity markets. Um, there's also good reasons to think about pricing or at least the equivalent of pricing at the, dis at the distribution level or at the very least, um, if it's feasible, we need to recognize that there are, you know, shadow values of um, constraints at the distribution level and think about what the consequences of those are because at the end of the day, they're going to affect market efficiency one way or another. So, um, I, mean, I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, DER ag aggregation technologies, but if this is a way to efficiently recognize the existence of those different constraints at different points on the distribution grid and manage those resources, then they'd certainly um, promote uh, efficiency, of the, efficiency of the grid. Um, so these are just kind of brief comments uh, meant to reiterate the motivation for these types of technologies and why if they're effective and can you know, be cost efficient and you get more take up, um, then this is just gonna efficiently promote the development of, of renewables and address um, carbon related challenges um, as well. So that's kind of the take from the, from the economist perspective. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Paul. I think that 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 is uh, really uh, uh, very insightful. Uh, I, I just want to touch on the the last point uh, uh, in terms of um, um, the, um, the the congestion. You know, the shadow price of the transmission distribution constraints. You know, certainly, I, I think. Uh, you know, I'm actually a, not brag by myself, but I'm actually I worked a lot on the wholesale market side and very familiar with the nodal pricing model for the for the wholesale market. So I, I think I think we do agree with you. We do need a locational 
uh, price signal for the distribution network to, to improve the market efficiency in there, uh, but may not be completely marginal driven uh, because I, I, I feel that it, it's, it, this, is, this is where the, it's a different because they also the customers, if you look at the, host, the wholesale generation pricing versus the retail, retail pricing, the reason there's a difference because also this, the, the customers may not want to expose all the by, to, to the to five minutes real time pricing and so on. So, so that in Texas, for example, last summer, we got a, a few like you know, very high uh, spikes, you know, the wholesale market price that, that is actually in, not impacting most of our CNI customers, even not less res residential cu customers. So I think I think the market mar the pricing mechanism for the local market and and for the distribution network is is a is a research topic at the moment. I, I also don't have a good answer, but I feel that that is that that is some some the area that we re require them really researchers to to put some focus on.